and I will be discussing a museological approach to movement building. Uh, this is an opportunity for us to have a really like family oriented discussion about the ways in which um, curators like myself are actively attempting to contextualize not only this moment, but all the moments that have predated it. Uh, this is a really big honor for me because um, I have been a big fan of what the foundation has done. And I think uh, this contribution to the discussion is not only timely, but I think it can move the discussion forward and helping us understand not only how social movements are created, but how movement building and museums actually can go hand in hand. Um, so let's get started. Um, I'll be going through 30 or so slides to um, address some of the things that I feel are the most urgent. Um, I'll be providing an introduction, uh, per the purpose, the problem, the solution, uh, a methodological approach entitled community curation, um, one of my favorite institutions, my previous work, preserving black spaces, my current work, and then finally the close. Um, I'll be speaking for about 45 minutes, so um, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about this discussion. So please uh, prepare some um, so we can talk as a community. Okay, so who, who am I? Um, well, my name is Tyree, again. Um, I am a Los Angeles, Los Angeles-based museum curator, public historian, activist, and speaker um, who works at the intersections of Black history, uh, um, grassroots movements, as well as museums and the classroom. Um, I am someone who is a big proponent of equipping communities of color, particularly marginalized communities, uh, with the political information that they will need in order to navigate the societies um, that we're currently in. Um, I have been a curator at the California African American Museum for three years and recently transitioned to the Autry Museum here in LA. And it's an exciting move that has garnered a lot of attention, not just surely for my work, but just the collaborative nature and the ways in which the Autry is engaging uh, contemporary art, uh, public history. Um, my previous uh, work, um, I've been a professor teaching African, Africana studies at Dominguez Hills here in the South Bay of Los Angeles. Uh, and before that, um, I was um, a, a graduate student at Temple University uh, in Philadelphia, where I cut my teeth on the Department of Africana Studies uh, there. Um, and so that's who I am. And I am the ripe old age of 31 for context. Uh, so what is the purpose of our meeting today? Um, well, the purpose of our meeting today is to offer you an, a museological approach that makes museums more equitable and assists in grassroots movement building. As you all have probably seen in the middle of this pandemic, that uh, a, a discussion has to be had about, uh, about a lot of museums, uh, excuse me, about a lot of institutions, but museums in particular. Um, many museums are having a major reckoning, um, not only in the conversation of racial justice, but what is the real purpose of a museum overall? Um, what, what does a museum look like when you can't walk in and see objects? What is, what is the purpose of the museum when communities of color still can't get into them? And um, as I've engaged in these conversations, not only internally at the Autry, I've been really incentivized to think about how we can move beyond the brick and mortar and equip and, 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 and provide access points for uh, various communities across the American West to engage with museum collections in a way in which they've never done before. And um, I've learned in a very short window of time in the middle of this pandemic, just how to do that, not only for museums, but in fact for racial justice, equity and inclusion. Uh, which allows me to, to present to you all uh, the major problem uh, that is happening not only in larger American society, but just within museums. And that first problem is representation in collections. If I can bring your eyes to this yellow circle, uh, you'll see who that uh, demographic is. And uh, you'll also see the surrounding uh, demographics that surround that larger circle. That slide is coming from a study done by the Public Library of Science, which says that 85% of all artists in US museum collections are white and 87% of them are male. Uh, 
Uh, this uh, problem is uh, one that is ongoing, um, but right now in the middle of conversations of racial justice and the reckonings that major museums are having, it behooves institutions to have ontological conversations about who museums are for, in the past, who museums have been for, who are museums still for, and who museums will be for in the future. And currently, if we were to just engage museums based on their collections, I think we understand the demographics as to who they've served, who they currently serve, and who the audience still is being underserved. Now I'll present to you the second problem. The other problem is that among museum curators, conservators, educators, and leaders, only 4% of museum staffs are African-American and 3% of those are Hispanic. Now, if you think about how all museums are positioned and where they are situated across the greater country, you, traditionally they are surrounded by um, communities of color. And, and, and I argue that until museums have staffs that reflect the communities that surround them, museums will still be engaged in a very volatile relationship, not only with their collections and staffs, but the content, their programming, and larger distribution of their materials, because many of them, unfortunately, are still awash in whiteness. So I'm sure you're asking me uh, and asking yourselves, um, why do these two problems exist? And uh, Tyree, what is the true solution at making museums more equitable and more responsible and tenable to, and malleable to the current moment that we find ourselves in? And I believe that that solution is done through two words. That is community curation. Um, to give you all a little bit of context, um, community curation is a, uh, is a methodological approach, a museological approach that deals with the curatorial inclusion of communities of color seldom involved in museum decision-making processes. Now this is really important to understand because if we think about museums as a whole, curatorially, they rarely have ever historically engaged communities of color that wasn't in a transactional way. Um, and given the, the colonial history of museums, oftentimes their collections support and have provided platform for empirical um, conquest, as well as limiting the exposure and marginalizing the voices of communities that um, have been exploited. And I think that the ways in which to remedy and reform museums is through this approach of community curation by having um, discussions of bringing in those communities into museum decision-making processes, whether it is curatorial, programmatic, um, or, or the like, and having their voices included at that proverbial table. That is a way in which we can rewrite the canon um, that has omitted and erased these communities overarchingly. Which allows me to reach to a formula that I wanna share with you all today. And that formula is pretty simple. It's museums plus community equal equitable museums. And um, in light of the major controversies that these museums have had, whether it be curators being hired who don't necessarily reflect the expertise, uh, excuse me, curators who have been hired at major museums who on the surface don't necessarily reflect the content and the expertise that they are said to possess, constantly create moments of major contention with museums and the communities that surround them, which usually result in major protests and, um, and uh, refrains of, of uh, democratizing the larger museum as a whole. And I am an advocate for those protests and the need to understand history more intimately and authentically. Um, and also calls to decolonize. And I think the ways in which we do that is in fact through this methodological approach of community curation. Um, this approach uh, isn't something that I coined nor invented, but it is one that, I, that has really changed the trajectory of my personal career after witnessing the success of 
the recent institution opening of the National Museum of African American History and Culture in Washington, D.C. Um, the, I call it NAMAC for short, um, has been a museum that has altered and broken records of museum attendance in ways in which the museum field has ever seen, <laughs> um, often reporting numbers of the millions of those who have sought to enter just to see and read the content on view. And this discussion is necessary because NAMAC is not only successful because of its, it, of its beautiful edifice and just the content that is on view inside of it as an institution, but at the core of it, it's a museum for the people, by the people. And that is important because at the foundation is what Dr. Lonnie Bunch, the, the founder and now the secretary of the museum, um, chartered by saying community curation is at the core of the success of that institution. Um, while Dr. Lonnie Bunch was um, the founder at NAMAC, he, uh, he in, in his time and tenure there, was uh, required to fill the galleries with objects that weren't in the Smithsonian collection. And so given his experience as a curator at the California African American Museum, he uh, was able to come up with an idea for uh, an antique road show type of initiative called Save Our African American Treasures, where he went all across the nation, um, going to America's urban centers to engage with the communities to uh, revisit their attics and their basements to cultivate and also excavate items of, of, of note that deserve to be on display, not only um, in their homes, but even perhaps for the museum of African American history and culture. And because of that uh, initiative, uh, they were able to amass um, thousands and thousands of objects that now are on display. And I argue that the success of the museum's offerings that are on display could not have been done without the community's investment, not only in it, in it as a collection, but as a place and destination for um, uh, grassroots uh, movement building. Which, is, which the black community in particular has always known intimately given their tenure in this country and nation. Dr. Lonnie Bunch um, once said that if you are a historian, your job is, is better be to help people remember not just what they want to remember, but what they need to remember. And that is also something that I have carried with me in my career as a museum curator and public historian. Uh, because oftentimes when one is thinking about African-American history and culture, they're traditionally only think about of five names. And those names are Dr. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, Thurgood Marshall, and Frederick Douglass. But as anyone can tell you, and someone who has proximity to black culture and history, that African-American history and culture is so much more than those five names that I so passionately love and support. It's actually, um, black history is not just black history, but it's American history. And if you're able to unpack and share the beauty of African American history with its, uh, in, in a larger scope, you're actually able to provide a democratic context that more Americans can adopt and uh, incorporate into their lives to making them better citizens in the United States of America. So that's why it's my job, like Dr. Lonnie Bunch says, and ultimately your job as well, to find history in ways um, that um, are not just comfortable, but also uncomfortable for us to understand the nuances of what it means to be a citizen of the United States. And we can do that through the communities that we engage as museum professionals and museum stakeholders. Now, uh, to truly and uh, truly, truthfully and honestly, um, when I was a, a curator at CAM, um, I didn't have um, an understanding of this methodology of community curation before, but it was the destination where I honed my approach um, throughout um, 11 exhibitions that I was able to lead in organizing alongside my, um, my history department, some of which have been no Justice, No Peace, LA 1992, which was an exhibition that gave a comprehensive overview of how 
Los Angeles, every 25 to 30 years, would go up in flames due to uh, civic uprisings. Uh, the exhibition highlighted not only 1992's uprisings, but it also focused on the Watts Rebellion of 1965 and also focused on the Zoot Suit Riots of 1943. And I did that um, in order to situate not only LA's history um, with black and brown communities, but also in the ways in which policy and procedure and op oppressive uh, modes, uh, oppressive policies and procedures often relegate communities of colors to the periphery. And every 25 and 30 years out of response to those policies, they, they respond to how um, their marginalization um, has impacted them for decades before. And it was a powerful exhibition that um, I was able to do at, the, at CAM that really situated um, the, the ways in which you can do public history without marginalizing um, generations, um, marginalizing intergenerations um, who may have an investment in the subject matter given the current political climate. Uh, that we all live in. And, and at that time, it was in the wake of the Ferguson and Baltimore uprisings, and also the 25th anniversary of the Los Angeles uprisings in 2017. Um, also at the museum, um, I had the opportunity to work alongside, uh, and, and, oh, and I must, I must remark, the only way I was able to accomplish that exhibition was working with the black and brown and Korean and law enforcement communities in LA to present the artifacts and materials that were on display. And, and as you can see from the slide, there was an actual police vehicle from the 1990s in order to contextualize um, the uprisings for those who may not have been able to remember. Um, my approach to community curation was also honed in an exhibition called How Sweet the Sound, Gospel Music in Los Angeles, where I, uh, the team and I worked over the course of 150 years to discuss how Los Angeles had become an epicenter for gospel music in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, many people don't know that because of Aretha Franklin's Amazing Grace album, uh, which she recorded in South Los Angeles, it would go on to become the most commercially successful gospel album of all time and solidify Los Angeles as the gospel capital of the world. Um, and this was a, a really interesting uh, thesis to approach because many people often don't think about uh, Los Angeles being a, a center for sacred music. Um, but because of, of Aretha Franklin and also the major um, pioneers like uh, Tom, um, Thomas Dorsey and uh, s s um, his, his colleagues, as well as... Um, who else? Uh, da, da, da. Um, uh, um, and so many others, uh, Andre Crouch included, who um, you, who were able to, and Sam Cooke, who used Los Angeles as a destination place in order to make sure that their, um, that not only gospel music was heard, but how civil rights and gospel music were intertwined. Um, a little uh, anecdote, a lot of people don't know that Dr. Martin Luther King visited uh, Los Angeles several times in order to uh, build out his uh, campaign for civil rights in Birmingham. And because of his vis visits to Los Angeles, particularly in Pasadena, um, I was able to work with uh, Friendship Baptist Church in Pasadena to display um, this, uh, if you follow my mouse, this pulpit, which is uh, where my mouse is. That pulpit was the same pulpit that Dr. Martin Luther King spoke twice on in the 1960s in order to galvanize Black Angelinos to support and ultimately fundraise his cause in the South. And this artifact itself was <laughs> um, just quietly uh, tucked away inside of an African-American church in Pasadena. And because of their participation, they lent it to me to display it within the exhibition, which allowed children in South LA, black children in South LA, to see and identify with Dr. King's movement um, in the 1960s in real time. So again, not, not possible without the community and their assistance in my curation. Moreover, um, I've done exhibitions that have centered Black women um, in film um, from the early race film period in the early 1900s. Um, and for those who don't know, race films were done by Black uh, filmmakers like Oscar Micheaux 
and the Lincoln Motion Picture Company in order to protest the portrayals of Black Americans from D.W. Griffith, D. W. Griffith's um, Birth of a Nation film. And these films ironically subverted the tropes that he attempted to, uh, you know, uh, concretize through his work um, and instead were allowed Black women to be not only the heroines, but those who would um, be able to assist the Black race in uplifting itself out of the miry muck of Jim Crow and um, Reconstruction. So that exhibition was also done with the help of the community of collectors who had a pr profound, um, you know, um, uh, motion, you know, silent film uh, poster collection. But also, I collaborated with students uh, within UCLA's Digital Humanities Department to give them proximity to the ways in which museums can be used to connect. Um, empirical data, scholarly research in the ivory tower to um, marginalized communities in South LA, which again, uh, couldn't have been done without community curation. Um, moreover, I've done another exhibition entitled California Bound, Slavery of the New Frontier, 1848 to 1865, which the history department at CAM and I um, successfully were able to direct um, new audiences on how to engage California's rife history and complicity with enslavement during the gold rush period. And this was a, a huge undertaking that couldn't have been done without that team um, and was responsible for um, situating um, Black Americans' um, inability to find true citizenship in LA because of that um, rife history of enslavement um, and all of the individuals who were um, a part of it. And it's, it's, this exhibition, again, couldn't have been done without local collectors who happen to have robust um, slavery memorabilia um, accessible. And they were a, we, I was able to collaborate them in order to bring this exhibition to life um, for CAM and its history department. And again, um, was able to move the needle in discussions of where um, California's borders were and who in fact were um, American citizens, black and or white, and, native, and indigenous people as well. And then uh, another exhibition that I'm very proud of um, and, and excited about that my team at CAM did was Cross Colors, Black Fashion in the 20th Century. And this exhibition was, was uh, a, a wonderful and huge undertaking to situate how uh, Los Angeles-based African-American owned brand uh, entitled Cross Colors, was able to, uh, you know, um, <sighs> catalyze a uh, multi-billion dollar industry um, that allowed Jay-Z, Sean P. Diddy Combs, um, Baby Fat, and um, so many other Black streetwear brands to become the successes, all because of the direct influence of this company. And this exhibition was was really fun because not only did we use the original clothing um, from the brand, but we also worked with the surrounding community to uh, highlight the other hip hop apparel brands that were important in the, 1990, the 1980s and the 1990s um, in order to uh, situate an understanding of the, the ways in which black fashion is truly political. Um, and again, this could not have been done without the community and their major contributions. And at the opening, we had an uproar of the exhibition and the other exhibitions at CAM. We had upwards of 5,000 people join us in order to celebrate not only the brand, but the latest suite of exhibitions to be offered. And again, could not have been done without the team at the, um, at the, at the museum. All because again, museum curation. Um, and, and, we, and I would be remiss to not bring up that you, the only way to do community curation is with the vote of confidence one pays to preserving Black spaces. Um, throughout the time of working with these various segments of the Black community here in LA and across the state, I saw particular spaces um, that have been historically noteworthy, but due to changing landscapes 
times, and demographics, those spaces were slowly being erased because of um, gentrification and other social forces. But um, working alongside those um, individuals within my community, we've been having active conversations about how to preserve these black spaces so that they don't get erased and they're only not just seen in museum exhibitions done by myself and other public historians who are in this particular research field. Um, and I have a, a special place in preserving black spaces because um, black spaces um, are able to not only direct us toward our future, but they give us a direct definition and litmus test for what the past was like for that particular group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, you all are probably wondering um, what I'm doing now. <laughs> um, those, the exhibitions that I just highlighted, highlighted to you were done through a course of three years um, at the museum. Many of those spaces were 5,000 square foot spaces uh, and or um, uh, exhibition spaces that were around or close to a, a thousand, a thirteen hundred. Um, currently, because of my tra recent transition to the Autry, I've been provided an opportunity to uh, reimagine what it looks like to curate um, the revolution or curate black spaces that have um, new uh, uses um, toward the communities and the communities who serve as allies. Um, and this is done at the Autry, the Museum of the American West. Um, since joining, um, I will admit that I was only at the Autry uh, and have only been at the Autry for a ripe young time of six months. Um, and in that time, there has been a global pandemic that is completely re, uh, forcing me to reimagine um, the ways in which I curate. But in that time being at home and, cu and curating in the midst of quarantine, uh, the curatorial team at the Autry were th are actively thinking about the ways in which we can um, use the museum um, as an access point to understand various communities of color, um, in the American West. Um, now, many of you all probably are also curious to know why did I transition into um, the Autry from CAM? And that was because the Autry's um, um, and its administration were really excited about reimagining and broadening out the perceptions of the American West beyond the tropes of just the cowboy and the Indian, if you will. And in that, it, it provided an opportunity for me to join um, a, a wonderful curator by the name of Joe Horse Capture from the National Museum of the American Indian um, in DC, as well as a museum in uh, Minneapolis, uh, to discuss and broaden out the ways in which these communities are, are presented um, in the Autry and largely across the West. But in that time, um, Joe and I and the other curatorial voices um, have been confined to our computers. And so out of those discussions and the prevalence of uh, people's use of PPE, we began to reimagine um, a, a collecting initiative very similar to Dr. Lonnie Bunch's Saving Our African American Treasures, where that served as the birth of the Collecting Community History Initiative, the West during COVID-19. Um, started on, in April of this year, we have been working across the American West to capture your voice, uh, the voices of the everyday man, the layman, the laywoman, the, the, the family um, during this time. And we've, all, we've been doing so through a digital archive where we've allowed people to submit not only their stories um, in digital accounts, but also images of their face masks, their home recipes, as well as um, their other materials and phot photography that could offer and contextualize this moment for the future. And I thought that this um, direction was, was, was important for the Autry to do because um, seldomly do, again, museums have the participation of the community to rewrite the Western canon and revisit the ways in which these communities have been collected about and collected upon. But this history initiative would then allow us to rewrite the historical canon for our children's children, just for us to see what this historical moment would be like for them and for us. 
Um, and the, this, um, this initiative has um, moved very quickly and we've received several hundred submissions in a short window of time and are beginning to have conversations about future iterations. Um, but in light of that, uh, during the middle of this, during the middle of COVID-19 and this quarantine, we've also seen a, a recent uptick of killings of African Americans by law enforcement and white vigilantism that allowed us to reimagine what the initiative was to do and the communities it would then serve, which served as the birth of the Collecting Community History Initiative BLM protests in the West. Now, I, admittedly, I don't think many people would ever associate Gene Autry and his museum with the BLM protests, but it, it, there are a lot more parallels than one could just see. And I make those parallels because many don't know that the Black Lives Matter movement actually started in the West. In fact, it started in Los Angeles um, with one of the co-founders of the movement, uh, Patrice Colors, and several and the local chapter of BLM, starting after Trayvon, George Zimmerman was acquitted for his killing of Trayvon Martin in 2013. And so given the history of Los Angeles, California, and its ability to spark social movements, it was befitting for the Autry to collect this historical moment and the diversity of individuals who have shown solidarity in this moment for the movement for Black Lives, hence the Collecting Community History Initiative BLM protests in the West. And we are very excited um, to present this ongoing and in, not only in a digital way, but ultimately in a physical space um, when we are allowed to after quarantine. Which allows me to come to my final thoughts. Um, I have about 15 minutes to go, but I will not, but I wanted to open it up for you. But my final thoughts are, um, museums cannot do what they do without you. I think for museums as a whole, in order for them to be true allies in this moment, they ought to rise to the occasion to meet you where you are. And that is the future of museums. Museums that um, are no longer just awashed in a single story um, that, that gives platform to a particular individual in name. However, it actually provides amplification of communities of color uh, that have for far too long been, <laughs> been uh, rewritten out of the historical canon. And this allows you to participate and understand what the curatorial process is if community curation is done and also allows us to reimagine this, the purposes of museum overarchingly. And with that, I come to the close and want to say thank you all for this powerful opportunity uh, to discuss my, my museological approach, how grassroots movements are started, and how we all can get free together and understanding this moment contextually. <laughs> Thank you so so much, Tyree. You're welcome. Uh, that was a great presentation. You can stop sharing your screen and then we'll have you up there. There you go. Um, we've been getting quite a few questions in the chat box. And um, John, did you want to start with one? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, wait, Tyree's I going somewhere. <laughs> Wait a second here. So we'll inspire some discussion until he comes back. Um, if people could uh, post some of their uh, questions in the question and answer box as well, um, the chat works too. Here he comes. Okay, Tyree, we got it. We have a good question for you. John's going to read that. So, uh, okay. the first question is from uh, Deb. She's uh, first of all thanking you for your great introduction to the possibilities of reflecting African American perspectives and history exhibitions. And she's saying, in partnering with community collectors and organizations, have you placed exhibits out in the community as a way to reach the audience you want outside of the walls of the museum? Wow, that's a great question. Um, we currently have not been able to work in public space yet, but given quarantine and, um, and my, the larger shelter and home uh, order that we just went through, I'm actually now seeing that my curatorial process has always been outside of the four walls of the museum. And in fact, has been curating the, or using the city as my gallery walls in order to present um, seldomly known aspects of its black history. And then I actually take from 
the public and bring it into the four walls. So I do the reverse. And so hopefully in, I, I pray that my career allows me to do both or it, there are things that are more public facing, but at this juncture, I think museums as a whole, my, my, my charter is to bring what's outside in as opposed to taking what's inside out. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's a great question. Chris, do you have a question? <laughs> yeah, I do. So, Tyree, you seem to have no small goals. Um, you actually want to help rewrite the Western canon as one of the yeah, books yeah. that I wrote. But um, we had a question on here, and it's something that I think is important to the people um, on our audience is, how, what are some ways that the um, ideas about the National Register, how can we sort of rewrite this method? You know, we've, we've been talking about this in historic preservation for 20 years, probably, and there really hasn't been a lot of, uh, despite efforts, you know, there needs to be a lot more work done in this area. What, do you have any advice for advocates for African American sites of, you know, sites of significance that haven't really been recognized yet? Yeah, I do. I think um, there has to be a reimagining of the, the entire process altogether. I don't think currently that the, the, the national registration process actually um, allows communities of color, uh, particularly African American experience, to latch onto the application process and democratize the opportunity for them to engage without the barriers society, uh, structurally that are in front of them. And I think if there are advocates and or individuals with resources to serve as um, grantees to making that process easier. I think that's how we can therefore break down the barriers and preserve more African-American spaces, black spaces um, across the board. Right, and, and that's, that's wonderful. And I was really impressed with your numbers that the Public Library of Science um, had created a study that showed that the representation in collections was 85% white, 87% male. And what we're interested in here at CPF <laughs> is what representation is that uh, in terms of, a, of a, the National Register, in terms of the California State Register, how many of these properties are representative of the Hispanic community, uh, the Asian uh, American community, African American. There, there's, there, I don't think the numbers exist yet. No. And so one of the things we're looking at, if there's no numbers, how do we set a benchmark? Yeah. So that's that's something that, that we're trying to aim for. I yeah. think John has the next question, <laughs> but do you have a comment? I, I look forward to supporting the, the, those endeavors and efforts. I think we <laughs> it's, all, it's, it's community curation. It's community curation. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have a question from Aja. Uh, she's saying she's witnessed the loss of a lot of history when our POC elders pass away and their belongings yeah. are valued by their younger relatives. Yeah. While there are some that save these tre treasures, others find their way to people through estate sales, etc. How can people like me help unite all of these people to help curate or loan items to exhibits? Wow, oh, that's a great question. Um, I think again that, and thank you, uh, Aja, for, for the question. I think that can only be done with partnering with um, culturally specific institutions and their uh, collections departments. I think that is like building inroads because. What I, what I would used to bang my head up on was like, why aren't museums so, why are they missing out to engage their publics? And then I realized that they're not talking to one another. And what I think I was privileged to do at CAM, which allowed me to hone my approach to community curation, was to have a direct in conversation where um, I um, was in charge of advising the, uh, a, an advisory council called the History Council that served as, a, as a, a soundboard for me and my exhibitions and public programming. I also included the elders at the table about what items I thought I should include in my exhibitions and ultimately in our collections. And this discourse showed me the dearth, um, but also the opportunity uh, to allow those um, uh, other museums to adopt that same approach and also to reimagine the possibilities of bringing in the elders into this conversation before they go on um, to the ancestral plane. Um, so yeah, work at the grassroots level, working with um, uh, uh, museums is the best bet and talking to curators is, is also great too. Okay, I have a question from Catherine in Rhode Island. Uh, <laughs> And she says, do you have advice on navigating, you know, there's some sometimes complex social relationships in communities, and how would you um, suggest any advice on how 
an, an established museum who's trying to expand and include more of this uh, type of content, but maybe seeing some resistance from the community because they have not traditionally been included. So like the first steps really of bridging this gap. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I would say that the best attempt at working with communities that want institutions have seldomly worked with is listening first um, and not talking first. <laughs> um, you, you, for, for far too long, institutions have thought, um, have created exhibitions and public programming for communities as opposed to with communities. And I think if there is a paradigm shift that um, reorients that structure, it'll allow a more seamless process in engaging um, exhibitions that um, really address um, the social ills that surround them in more forthright ways. Um, and I think that is the way to do it. Listening first, talking second. Okay, so I have a question from Justin. These are Spitfire. They're like, pew, pew. Yeah. <laughs> I'm getting good at, I hope I'm getting good at this. <laughs> on my toes, I'm on my toes. Um, are you ready? I am, I am. Okay. <laughs> um, so it, this is actually an easier question. Uh, <laughs> What advice do you have for a, a young black curator? Oh yeah, oh man. Um, it, uh, it, also, it, it all depends on where they are in their, their career, because um, um, age is all in, in the mind, of course. Um, I would recommend for advice for young black curators is to find um, other black curators like me um, who, and email them um, to see and, and have informational meetings to see where they are and how they um, may be able to support them in their career trajectory. Um, again, as I read in my slide, um, only 4% of all museum professionals are of African American descent. Um, and this, and I have a particular mandate and charter to create pipelines of access for um, black, um, uh, black curators um, because there was a very, important few people who opened the door for me to help me see myself uh, um, in this role. And so whoever that individual is, um, I pray uh, you connect with me after this so we can talk and um, discuss opportunities like the Getty Multicultural uh, uh, internship that allows um, pipelines to be created for um, curators of color. Um, and a question uh, from Dorothy, she's saying, in terms of preserving black spaces, are you involved in preparing nominations for the National Register, or is that? Oh, not, not yet, but I hope, I hope to serve on committees and panels, excuse me, committees and panels, um, and offering my historical expertise to strengthen applications. So if um, that individual or they recognize um, historic sites that need preser preserving and need a historical voice to attach, and there is some synergy. I look forward to, forward to partnering to making that a reality. So, Tyree, are you enjoying this? We said that we ask a lot of questions, I right? Know, I'm, I'm glad I ended when I did because they're they're coming. They're coming. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we have a good one here about, um, which actually was one of my questions as well, since museums will probably be closed for a long time, realistically. Um, this um, Asia said that she would love it if you did another Zoom with a slideshow of some of the exhibits taking, like, do you have any plans to do sort of curated tours of your, like recorded curated tours of your museum so people can see what you're, you're doing? Well, well, sadly, because of my transition from the uh, from CAM to the Autry and also the larger exhibition calendar, there isn't a, in a way for me to uh, give a, um, a history um, tour of my previous work. Um, and also, um, yeah, it's, just, it's not safe nor sound. Um, however, if anyone ever wants to uh, see the work that I've done, um, and the, the the larger tours I've done I've done through video in them. You can check out my website, which offers um, a, a step by step. I was just going to ask you that. So, I, yeah. John, if you don't mind posting his website uh, in the chat box, so everybody can connect to that. Do, can you take a second to talk about the the I think the Freedom Papers Toolkit yeah. that you put yeah. together? I was really impressed with that. How do you see that? As a, people can get that from your website. Yeah, right? yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, in the middle of the quarantine and also um, through a very heated um, moment of 
of righteous indignation after the killing of George Floyd, um, I was catalyzed to to support the movement for Black Lives through um, um, educational resources. Um, and I think that we all at this time um, in the question of how to be a better ally or how to be um, a, a, a show solidarity for the movement and for Black Lives, we have a certain skill set that we can offer corporately that can support with a anti-racist toolkit called um, Freedom Papers, which is a, a toolkit chock full of uh, Black political education resources to help onboard Black Americans and our allies um, to understand uh, the Black social condition in the United States. Um, and so if people are interested in understanding the social conditions for African Americans in the U.S., um, you can get that curated chock the curated toolkit on my website by just providing your email and you'll immediately get access to it as a whole. It's a free resource and um, it is my contribution to the movement and solidarity for black lives. So um, yeah, um, and it's been very successful, very popular. I, 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 I'm very happy to support um, those who in their continued learning and I'm glad I can bring what museums do so so um, effectively outside of museums to the general public as a public historian. Yeah, that's how I found your work was through the, the Freedom Papers Toolkit. A, a friend of mine shared it. See, uh, it works, it works, not in front of it. Around. I know, right? So, uh, John, you have another question, right? Oh, it's hard to keep up with these, but uh, I'm, we're trying to- positive problem. We're, in, we're having a positive problem right now. Yeah. Um, first of all, I just have a comment, uh, somebody, uh, it was Pamela, she said she loves the idea of community curation. And mm -hmm. I like this quote, until the story of the hunt is told by the lion, the tale of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and it's, it's when I, I that's, that, that quote is uh, practically etched on my heart. Um, and, I, and I think uh, as lions, I, attributing um, or personifying ourselves as lions, I think we're, we're we as a, we're, we're we're more impactful as a herd, or like we're more impactful as a as a group of lions than just one solo. And so, I want more people to be able to um, speak truth to power um, and not have the hunter um, write our stories for us because we're far more powerful. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and I, I actually have sort of a question of my own. I was thinking, sure. about, um, uh, as a public historian myself, uh, yes. you know um, how uh, painful sites. Uh, are, you know, p sites that have a lot of uh, painful memories associated with them. I'm thinking specifically of a site like Parker Center, uh, yeah. the former headquarters of the LAPD, which was demolished recently. I mean, what are your thoughts on preserving sites that have a um, uh, challenging or painful or difficult history and how, how do you interpret those sites? Ooh, uh, this is a question I've gotten uh, many times over the last several weeks about my opinion about those sites, as well as monuments, obelisks, to um, white supremacy in the larger Confederate tradition. And my thoughts are very, very succinctly are, I do believe that many of them should be torn down. I don't think that they should be taken away, though. Um, I think that they should be torn down, taken down by whomever, you know, I, I don't advocate for vandalism. <laughs> I'm not for vandalism. But I am asking that context, const, um, historical contextualization happen about whatever these objects are so that our children's children don't um, forget how we responded to this moment and how we um, ultimately were able to attempting to rewrite the ways in which we've addressed history and have had history addressed to us. Um, and I think those, mo uh, those sites as well um, um, it, should also be seen through those same lenses um, and whether it's them as a whole or pieces of them are kept and preserved in order to serve as memorials um, and, and commemorate them in historical context, we can be better stewards of this moment in history as we want, desire to be for future. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. I know here in Orlando there was a statue, uh, a Confederate statue at the Lake Eola and they moved it to the cemetery. Which is which was a perfectly good, uh, you know, this is still a place where you would go and, and you know look at statuary, and that's where I, I go to understand the past is, yeah. is the cemetery. But uh, that's Agreed. one of my side hobbies. Anyway, <laughs> I have a, another question for you. Sure. Um, do, do you believe that the existing lack of representation among museum staff is due to their board makeup and key donors? And how do you incentivize new leadership in these areas? 
Wow, that's a, that's a good one. Um, the answer is yes, yes, yes. Um, but I, I don't think the buck can stop in just one person. Um, again, these are these are institutional issues that um, that are ripe with and have a history that is predicated on um, you know pro providing certain platforms to others at the expense of at the expense of others. And I think if we are going to look at this moment. Um, and address this larger reckoning, it has to be from a multifaceted approach that addresses not only the inequities in boardrooms, but also the inequities in collections and then the inequities in the gallery walls and the inequities across the board. And again, the only way to do that is providing more voices at the table. <laughs> because sadly, those rooms that, that I just mentioned are far too homogenous. <laughs> Way too homogenous for us to continue in the way in which we want to go. Way too homogenous. So that's my thoughts. Um, and I look forward to partnering with anyone who wants to do that work. I think it's important, and I'm glad that the Autry is an institution that is seeking to address it, address those same things too. Yeah, I mean that's how we met. So I, for everybody who's listening, uh, you know, I read about your work uh, in the New York Times, and I saw you in the LA Times, and I said uh, I've got to get in touch with Tyree. Yeah, here busy, we are. I'm a busy guy. <laughs> I'm, a busy, sure. I'm a busy. I think John's working up for the next question, right, John? I I have one for you, um, and we're talking about aspirations now. Uh, sure. So what what is a uh, is there a dream? Uh, Dorothy is asking, is there a dream project you would like to see come to fruition? Man, yeah, there is one. Um, and I guess this is this will be my pitch until it happens. Um, but um, very much in the vein of uh, Brian Stevenson of the Equal Justice Initiative um, and his work at prison reform and making markers uh, that uh, give proper context to the history of lynching in America. My pitch and goal is to actually create uh, physical markers uh, across the state of California of all of the areas where enslavement occurred for Black and Indigenous and um, Asian Americans. And I think th those markers and a project of that scale would help to contextualize and also disabuse people of the notion of California's liberal <laughs> liberalism um, and, 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 and give it proper context because I don't think we can, I, I'm not one who believes that we can give the South all of the credit for its Confederate views. I think we also have to deal with our own in our own backyard historically. And I think as much as these markers will allow us to finally make peace and reckon with that past, it'll also allow our children to give them a proper starting point um, about how we gave proper reconciliation to those communities in real time. So that's my goal. Like I wanna do a project like that and if anyone wants to fund me or give me a grant, we can email each other because I want to do this before it's all said and done. <laughs> That's good. Tell you, we have so many questions coming in. It's actually hard to like. It's actually hard to read and keep up, <laughs> keep up with these. Um, so we are. Why, while John and I are trying to find the next question, why don't you uh, share with everyone where they can get in touch with you? Yes. Um, well, again, I just want to say thank you to everyone. I think we have like north of 150 people join our conversation and I'm so honored that you all took your time and your lunch to share with me. Um, if you'd like to keep up with my work, um, I have a newsletter that I distribute rather frequently on my website. My website is tyreebp.com. It's very simple. Uh, it's tyreebp.com. You can also follow me on all uh, major social media networks at the same um, screen name, Tyree BP, and I would love to just continue this discussion. Let's not let, let it just be an hour long, but let it be an ongoing one, because I feel like we are at a right moment to change the country and the ways in which we view its history together. Yes, thank you, for sure. Okay. <laughs> John, do you, did you have a good question uh, teed up here? Uh, yeah, I have one. Um, this is about you. Uh, what made you want to be a curator? Well, um, it, very, very quickly, because I know we have about two minutes left. Um, it was 
really, I really blame my grandmother, who I was raised by. Um, my grandmother, um, who was one who was a big advocate for self-education um, and understanding Black political education, often took me to the California African American Museum as a boy. And so when I was in fourth and fifth grade, I was walking through the galleries learning Black history there. So it doesn't, it, it, <laughs> I'd be remiss to not acknowledge that same past when I became the curator for that same institution um, decades to come. And so um, I, I'm so grateful that my, my, my grandmother exposed me to the museum field, but also for CAM's leadership in seeing me fit to come on board as staff, um, as a professor, in order to reimagine what Black history in the American West looks like for um, intergenerational audiences. Yes, I, I think that's a, a great goal. And so we have one more question, then we'll start wrapping it up. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we deal with in, in historic preservation is that um, a lot of communities of color, uh, you and I talked about this on the phone a little bit, that the, the buildings that uh, are, you know, best represent the community might be buildings that are not typically uh, considered eligible for the National Register. Yeah. So yeah. the church might be the most representative. The connected to that is that the houses are usually of like what we would call vernacular style. So mm -hmm. not architecturally distinguished. And so what advocates come up with a lot, and this happens um, frequently, is it doesn't look historic. And so it's, it doesn't pass through some of these um, gatekeeper processes of that what would be significant or not. And do you have any ideas like how, um, just to close out the conversation, ideas on on how people can argue for the significance of a site that might not look historic at first glance. You're on mute, Pachayri. <laughs> okay. Um, there you go. <laughs> I would, that's, a, that's a toughie. That's a toughie. And I, I don't have um, a full answer quite yet. But I think it's because I, um, need to have a discussion with more people about this. And so I welcome more people to um, to engage this thought with me um, beyond this conversation because I'm still trying to figure out how it's the best way to address it. Um, and I feel like there has to be more voices at the table. I agree. And then just as an aside or in a in, uh, link to that thought, if anyone who's listening today wants to, uh, you know, send us your thoughts about this, uh, you can um, communicate with us at CPF on our Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn, and Twitter. And we also have a program coming up on Wednesday, which is about the modern, modern master architects, in case you want to catch up on some of that. Um, I guess we need to close out, Tyree. Thank you so much for all of your time today. We really appreciated it. And I think, and I can tell from the comments that people really value uh, your, your thoughts on this. Thank you for this opportunity to work with you and John. And I hope that this is just the start of our, our, our really robust relationship. Thank you. John, you want to close it out? Uh, yeah, all I will say is that I posted a link to an evaluation form. So just let us and Tyree know how we did. And um, if you have any suggestions on future programs, we will be continuing this conversation. This isn't the end of the series, so to speak. Um, we'll be continuing to do more programs. So we want to hear what you would like to see. Um, and that's it. So uh, visit that link. And thanks again for your time today. Thanks, Tyree. Bye, everybody. Bye. <laughs>